Joe Manchin and Bernie Sanders are sparring this week because Joe Manchin said something like, I don't believe that we should turn our society into an entitlement society. The Nordic societies, which we might call entitlement societies, actually seem to be working pretty well. So like, why did they work so well? And it, I mean, clearly the entitlement part isn't actually hurting them, right? Yeah, you know, I mean, the phrase that they actually use is they call themselves welfare societies, which is an even <laughs> more loaded term, I imagine, in the American context. Um, but yeah, I mean, the thing is, we have a lot of quote unquote entitlements already, right? If you once you reach a certain age, you get Medicare and you get uh, the old age pension. If you're disabled, you get a certain amount of money. I got a kid in public school right now. It's like we have sort of like a half built welfare state of sorts. It's just that we miss, we're missing a lot of benefits that they have. Uh, most obviously around family benefits, right? The child allowance, the paid time off, the uh, usually they'll cover health care for all kids, including dental, the free school lunch. We have that a little bit, though it's means tested. Like you can go on down the line. Um, and we just don't have those things. And it's sort of weird because, you know, there are a lot of different ways to think about the welfare state. But one that I'm especially partial to is if you kind of look at it closely, one of the things you'll notice is Ben welfare benefits mostly go to people who can't work uh, or who aren't currently working. And the obvious reason for doing something like that is that in a capitalist society, if you don't work, you don't get money, but you still need money to live, right? So if you're retired, you don't make a wage, but you need money. So we give you social security, same if you're disabled and so on. Well, children, it's the exact same story, right? They don't work, but they need stuff to live. And so that's why you have child care benefits and education benefits and the child allowance and paid leave, which is basically kind of like a child care benefit for the parent. All that is basically just compensating for the fact that in a market economy, children is as if they don't exist. There's nothing an employer can do to account for the fact that, you know, employee one has three kids and employee two has zero kids. Um, and this was this is how the welfare state used to be talked about. I mean, before the 50s or, or maybe even a little bit before then, if you go through these other countries, I put a, a piece on mattbrunick.com not too while ago where I had a, a graphic that was from 1943 or something that was in Switzerland. And the graphic is just titled, Why Family Allowances? And they had this graphic uh, where they showed two workers working at the exact same factory who had the exact same wages. And one of them went home and he lived in a house by himself. And the other one went home and he lived in a house where he had a wife, three kids, and an elderly mom that was living with him. And the captions were like, you know, identical workers, very different lives, extremely different lives. You know, like the, the one who lives by himself has essentially six times the income of the one who doesn't because he has to stretch his income across all of these retired parents and kids and all the rest of it. And so that was why family allowance. Family allowance is to equalize these things. Um, and yeah, so I mean, that that's like a... I feel like that's just kind of gone from the discourse generally. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> that's that's the graphic. Uh, it's it's a really interesting, and it's no one talks about the welfare state this way, but it that that's what makes sense, and that's why universal benefits also make sense. Because notice in this graphic, they're not saying the guy is poor. Yeah, he has to care for five relatives, but he he may not be poor. He works at a factory, could have a good enough wage to cover them, but he's unequal. He's unequal to the guy who's living alone. And that's why you have the family equalization fund, I think is what they call it. So. Well, but Matt, have you ever considered that the children and the elderly should probably be earning their own wages? No, Maybe I'm just kidding. I think, I think we make this joke literally every time you come on. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, children are, are banned from working. That's, <laughs> you know, maybe yeah. they could, they could, you know, relax that ban for parents of, <laughs> or children of low income parents. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, well, Matt, I want to ask about because uh, the things that you say, you you talk about this stuff, you know, you, you at the dinner table with your family and they say, well, but there's both the, they're very small countries. They're all white. Uh, and they're all committing suicide all the time. Uh, that's the, the other one you hear, which I'm, I've, I haven't like looked into it, but I'm like sure is bullshit. Uh, is I've the heard, suicide? I've heard that thing no, I've heard that Denmark is like the happiest country. It, it always ranks as like the happiest country in the world. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And, you know, people will fight about these measures of happiness, you know. I think the most, the biggest critique is just like, it's more of a measure of just kind of 
broad-based contentment, I guess, which that seems fine as well, but it's, I don't know, people get mad about that sometimes. And like, it's not really happiness, it's just that they kind of have a have an okay contented attitude with their life. It's like, okay, well, that's what I want. So, <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, that sounds all right. <laughs> um, but yeah. yeah, can you I mean, truly be happy in this life, Matt? Uh, you know, that's a, that's another question. The, yeah, the other thing happiness even <laughs> possible. The other thing people point out, I mean, you're right with the suicide stuff. I don't know where that data is now, but of course they'll point out that, hey, these are not perfect societies. They have all sorts of problems. In Finland, they like to drink a lot. Um, there are domestic violence issues, you know, j just like anywhere. Um, they do have high rates of antidepressant use, but then you look into it and it's like, well, yeah, but it's, it, it's, it's dark, like, like 20 hours a day and you know like so it's like yeah i'm not saying i would even necessarily want to go move there because it's like a frozen you know dark uh, frosty you know like kind there's of 7-eleven no there dude there's no 7-eleven and yeah that's true that's true but you know their their biggest they do have their their biggest uh like uh grocery store they're like walmart in uh in finland is a is a consumer co-op um and they have oh, they wow. have convenience stores so um but yeah so it's like yeah there are a lot of issues there and you, you know you, if you had to choose between la and living in helsinki you probably would choose la because helsinki is is cold and dreary um but we're talking about their economic system we're not talking about their weather you know or other problems they might have so yeah i i, I want to just point out one last thing which is um matt you talked you talked about this when i like interviewed you for a different thing like ages ago, but an, an interesting thing about, I think, uh, the sort of American response to the Nordic states now, or like the right wing American response is, you know, you pointed out that uh, the conservatives used to be like, the Nordic states are just so awful. And like their economies are doing so terribly because they're socialist. Now that it's, you can't really dispute that those countries are doing really well. Now, conservatives have sort of flipped and they've been like, well, actually these countries are doing well because they're secretly capitalist. Yeah. Is, that, is that still going on? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I, you actually see a lot of people on all sides kind of doing that. It seems to behoove people in different ways. Yeah. For conservatives, of course, they want to, you know, distance any successful country from socialism. Same thing for liberals who will do the same thing. And I remember, I think one thing, one time it was Jonathan Chait, or it may have been someone else. He wrote a piece that said, you know, Denmark is... Uh, like neoliberalism on steroids or something like that. And it's just like, okay, I don't know what to tell you. Like, <laughs> it's like, is, is it neoliberalism when you just like leave McDonald's stuff in the ocean and just like won't, won't un unpack it? Um, but they'll do that. And then you get it on the left too, because the left, yeah. you know, the hard left wants to be like, look, we want to do, we want to go beyond mm -hmm. what they have done. And so we want to kind of distance that. And like, I get why all those motivations play out that way, but you know, as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm willing to say, well, you know, on a, on a kind of spectrum, <laughs> they're definitely much further down the line, you know, in, in Finland, the, the government owns 30% of the wealth. Uh, and yeah. in Norway, it's, it's 60%. They've got state owned enterprises all over the place, um, you know, and then the welfare state and then these labor unions that, you know, wh whether you call that socialism or not, clearly they have a lot of power and a lot more say in what happens in the economy than workers here have. So I'm, I'm more comfortable just saying they're moving down the socialist path and have gone much further than we have, and it seems to be working well. So let's, let's at least try to catch up with them and maybe, you know, run, run by them if, if we ever get to the point where we could do that, you know. Now, Matt, uh, just to wrap up, I've always wanted to ask you this. Uh, you know, we've never spoken about it. You've been known in the past to make people mad online sometimes. But I think the thing that makes the people the most mad, and if you don't want to talk about this, that's fine because it might be too personal, is uh, your thing with electric uh, stoves instead of gas stoves. Yeah. What's, explain explain the why the electric stove is better than the gas stove because people get very mad about that. And it's a they very do. touchy subject. 
Yeah, no, uh, you know, uh, for the obvious reason, burning um, methane in your house is, is not good for you, for your health, not good for the environment. It's uh, associated with asthma and other kinds of problems in children. I think anyone who thinks about it for a second would realize that having a, you know, just, just burning natural gas in the middle of your house is like not a great idea. The reason I, I pick it up is because there's a certain kind of like, lib foodie culture that's really kind of fetishizes the gas stove and those are people that are really like fun to irritate and so mm. you know but they also love the climate they love the climate and they love their like foodie gas stove stuff and so mm. we've got this tension that we can just we can just get <laughs> them pissed off about <laughs> are you saying that the libs are hypocrites dude uh. <laughs> we would never yeah. If you enjoyed this video from Jacobin Weekends, please hit like and subscribe. That way, you'll enjoy all of our backlog, as well as all of our future content, including interviews, live streams, and clips. Thank you.